before I get to Haroon, just, you know, over the last decade or so, it is, there has been the sense that all unions really want is higher wages, but in actual fact, what you are saying, um, all three of you have said, is that unions want to keep headcount because they want to keep the jobs relevant for their members. So would you, would you agree that we've got to a point where job pressure is now so intense because you're busy defending the position you're in, this whole wage will story versus other type of costs like procurement, for example. Are we in a position where there have been potentially higher wages, I'm not saying in any specific sectors, but overall, you know, Treasury shown us the public sector out earns the private sector, but is that not where we can start to negotiate versus actual just job cuts? I, I don't think anyone in this economy wants to actually see people lose their jobs when it comes to the, to the end of it. But are we, are we actually just splitting the two here and saying, well, we can't forego jobs, but we can actually start to negotiate when it comes to pay or, or um, conditions, you know, the things that would come with having a job itself. Well, I think if you're going to start that conversation, let's start where the fat is. Mm, you will mm. talk about trimming the fat. Mm. There's no fat where the workers are. There's plenty of fat at the levels of CEOs. Mm. I mean, there have been many reports to break down the fact that there's a massive, massive wage gap between what CEOs mm. earn in South Africa versus what ordinary workers earn. And if we actually have to go further, um, the, the real truth of the South African crisis is the fact that the South African economy remains racist. What we have, and even today in 2020, is a very racist economy. If you look at um, Department of Labor's own reports when they talk about employment equity, even today, black women in particular mm -hmm. earn far less than black men, who, from white men who do the same work. It is because there has been no fundamental change where fundamental change needs to take place at the highest level. So if we're not going to actually call a thing a thing and deal with the actual root of the problem, which is that our economy, just like under apartheid, even today, continues to remain racist, continues to be dominated by white males, and industries dominated by white males, and even where there are the few sprinkling of black males or, or black people, the same um, culture of racism continues until we deal with that fundamental issue. Unfortunately, we're not going to get anywhere. And this is actually the nub of the crisis in South Africa. It has been exposed even by the World mm -hmm. Bank to say that if you want to deal with um, extreme levels of poverty in South Africa, widening levels of inequality, you've got to deal with the fact that there is massive income inequality in South Africa, and that will require um, radical intervention and drastic decisions. That cannot happen with what our government has done with the national minimum wage of imposing a poverty national minimum wage of 20 rand an hour. I mean, that's just insulting. Who can live on that? And when you break it down, in fact, the way they've, they've done it, you've got workers who are actually earning 11 rand per hour if, if you're EPWP. So the point I'm making is that we have been in constant denial of this one a true problem which underlines our crisis in this country, which is that racism is at the core of how we operate. And until we deal with that, unfortunately, there will be no real change in the economy. And you will continue to have workers who are frustrated. You will continue to have uh, this strife between the labor force and, and management because we're not dealing with fundamental issues. Great point. I think it's good to we'll just quickly bring Harun in to have his, um, his say. I know you've done a lot of work on what you call the missing middle. And I think talking about income groups here, maybe just to explain to the audience what, what type of work you've done. Yeah, so I feel a little bit like the minority party here with the unionists <laughs> on the right. So uh, as an academic having done, so I thought I'd crystallize a few comments that actually bring together a lot of the inputs here based on, based on evidence, based on research. And, being an academic, I have facts, and there are five facts that I think bring together this notion of growth, employment, and wages that I think have to feed into any integrated discussion about where jobs are going to come from, what's happening to wages, thinking about minimum wages, and so on. First fact is South Africa is the poster child for being in a middle-income country growth trap. We've grown for 40, over 40 years at a rate of 0.29% per annum uh, in real terms. 0.29, that wasn't 
0.29. China's grown at 9% per annum. Vietnam's grown at 5%. India's grown at 5%. So you're at the core of it, right? The magic silver bullet that you want is economic growth, right? Everybody across the spectrum believes in growth, which is the type of growth and so on. But at that level, we're sitting at the bottom end of the, of the, of the classroom of middle-income countries. Forget industrialized countries. That's the first fact. The second fact that I think often is underappreciated, if we think of the discourse in the media and so on, is that we are now a de facto services-based economy. 60% of GDP comes from the services sector, which effectively means that your growth drivers lie outside of agriculture, mining, manufacturing. And the latter reflects a very important change in the structure of economic growth, which is we've gone through a period and we have we have many cousins uh, in the world economy. We've gone through a period of premature deindustrialization, right? Manufacturing used to be the lifeblood of long-run growth for every single East Asian economy. It's no longer the lifeblood of growth in South Africa. Where are the low-wage jobs in manufacturing? That's, that's, that's a huge, huge question uh, that academics, in fact, are, and researchers are looking at. So the fact that you've got a services-based economy that's driving growth, leads to, to some extent, this notion of the public sector because 90%, and that's my third fact, right, that there's been insufficient employment creation since 1994. If you look at growth, so I've, I'm using my words carefully, insufficient employment creation, not jobless growth. So we've created, the numbers show about 16.5 million jobs since 94. I know that sounds crazy, but that is true, right? Um, despite stubbornly high unemployment rates, what you've got is an economy, though, that's unable to create a sufficiently large number of jobs relative to the growth of the labor force. That's the key, right? So the number of jobs <laughs> being created is much lower than the rise in the number of new entrants. That's your problem, right? Not jobless growth. Um, but why we get into this issue of the public sector and employment creation and so on is if you, if you, if you, uh, if, if, if you take out that employment creation over, the, over say, a 10-year period and you look at it as a sectoral basis, all the jobs, 90% of jobs created, have come from the services sector. Telecoms, right, um, tourism, you name it, uh, believe it or not, airlines and so on. But a third of the total, not a third of services, a third of all jobs created have come from the public sector. So the largest single job generator since uh, nine, you know, since 2000, you can take a longer period, has been the public sector. And I think that's been the empirical challenge that, hang on, right? Uh, what's going on here in terms of uh, public sector employment creation leading jobs, right? That doesn't, so I think Neil's right. It doesn't mean that the counterfactual is true. Therefore, you've got a bloated public service. That's a debate that needs to be had about about uh, the size of the public sector relative to other countries and so on. But it means that private sector job creation is lagging uh, the public sector. Fourth fact is the one I've been going on incessantly in all platforms is the rise of the missing middle. And this is a really crucial point. And in fact, my colleague from Noomsa, so I'd like to test it, this is my, this is my moment, right? <laughs> is that if you look at wages, so if you can imagine, I can't help this, imagine an axis, wage growth, vertical axis, Horizontal axis has lowest earner to highest earner. And you're plotting on the vertical axis the percentage change in wages since 94. Since 94, lowest earner to highest earner. That graph is U-shaped. It's an absolutely fundamental change in inequality dynamics in the society. What it means is that those in the middle of the distribution have seen an erosion of their wages. So the problem is not to protect the bottom end. The problem is to look after the middle of the distribution. And that's a really important dynamic because I think, unfortunately and unknowingly, it's not a deliberate thing, unions, employers go into a bargaining situation and they say, okay, let's look at the top and the bottom, let's bring the bottom up. Actually, you've done that job. You've done it so well that you've disadvantaged those in the middle. And, and we can talk a lot about the missing middle, but that's an important phenomenon about how that feeds in. Somebody earlier talked about fees must fall. Right? The fact that uh, middle class households are feeling the brunt of a low growth economy is exactly that story. Final fact, union membership uh, as a whole, union density figures, so let's be clear, relative to OECD averages are not particularly high or low. 
So we have a union density estimate that's about 25%. It hasn't changed. What has changed is that private sector union density figures, so private sector union membership over employment in the private sector has gone down. But into its breach, because that union, overall union density estimate has stayed the same, is that public sector union membership has grown dramatically. So in many ways, you've got this uh, political economy challenge of largely uh, a very large dominant public sector union movement, right? Michael's smiling, he knows this, right, in real terms. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, 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 a demoralized, viscerated private sector union movement. But let me leave it there. Those for me are the really key five facts, at least, that need to be in this analytical pot as you think about labor challenges going forward. You want to, you want to pick up? I, um, you want to say something? Well, Harun said a whole lot of other stuff, but I was also going to raise a fact. Uh, which is that between 2006 and 2018, the, the number of public servants earning a million rand or more increased from 9,600 to 29,000. Uh, and the total number of spending on this group rose from 5.8 billion to 38 billion, or from 4% to 7.4% of spending. So it's again, it's where, and in, in the private sector as well, where is the surplus going? How is the cake being divided up? And the cake is being divided up very, very unequally. I mean, I think, you know, Arun's fact about the lower end, again, that needs to be disaggregated. And we need to look at the extent to which low income earners have seen a real improvement in their pay. I think that's debatable uh, for certain periods and for, 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 for many sectors. But what is very clear is that those at the top of the public sector and the private sector mm. have taken a disproportionate share of the cake. And when it comes to the public sector and reorienti reorienting it, as we were saying, to flatten those hierarchies, when the public sector uh, restructuring first took place, there was this compression. There, I think there was something like, uh, Neva would know, it's something like 230 uh, pay grades in the public sector, and they broadbanded that uh, to about 12 uh, uh, and, and massively reduced the levels of inequality in the public sector. That inequality has now again grown uh, quite significantly. And so that's one of the issues that, that, that needs to be addressed both in the public and the private sector. 